Good morning, and I want to wish everyone a happy Easter morning. I know that many of you will watch this again later or watch it for the first time. And I'm thrilled today for this Easter. I've seen since I've been a Christian 65 Easter's that come and go, but you know the Lord Jesus was resurrected from the dead, came forth from the tomb. We serve a living Savior, not a dead religious leader. I'm so thrilled that the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. As Jesus was resurrected from the dead and came forth from that tomb, we are, if we precede the rapture, that is, we die before the rapture occurs, when Jesus comes, the Bible says we are going to be risen with Him, the living Savior. Today I'd like for you to see the music and see the service from a year ago where we celebrated Easter. The reason for that is we had not only a full church, a great environment, but I think you'll really enjoy what was presented last year in our program. It was a great worship service. We had tremendous things happening, results, and we praise the Lord for that. And I believe we could relive it today and really be blessed by it and edified and encouraged. I want to thank the Lord for the great choir and music, musicians and singers, all those who make up the great worship services here in the church. And I want to thank all our leaders who are so faithful in doing the things that we all need to do. And so now let's go into the service from last year. to see you this morning and uh, a delightful day wonderful day it was a terrible week for Jesus in the sense of his being exclaimed the king and Hosanna and the palms and all that and then the fickleness began and when he didn't fulfill the power and the rulership of the Jewish people they finally decided that after all the miracles that only God could do, they uh, rejected him. He had Passover dinner with his disciples, which is what we call the Lord's Supper, communion. And then the two terrible trials that were held illegally. And finally, the crucifixion. There's a disappointment. And then the resurrection, when it all really began. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad we have a Savior that lives and not a dead religious leader in the tomb? How much does the Lord know about you today and about me? Hello, is this Gordon's pizza? No, sir, it's Google Pizza. Did I dial the wrong number? No, sir, Google bought out the pizza store. Oh, all right then, I'd like to place an order, please. Okay, sir, do you want the usual? The usual, you know what my usual is? Yeah, according to the caller ID, the last 15 times you've ordered a 12 slice with double cheese, sausage, and thick crust. 
Okay, that's uh, what I want this time too. May I suggest that this time you order an eight slice with ricotta, arugula, and tomato instead. No, I hate vegetables, but your cholesterol is not good. <laughs> How do you know? Through the subscriber's guide, we have the results of your blood test for the last seven years. You know what? I'm, I'm sick of Google. I'm sick of Facebook, Twitter, and everyone else having all my information. I'm, I'm going to an island without internet where there's no cell phone and line and no one to spy on me, no towers. I understand, sir, but you may want to renew your passport. It expired five weeks ago. <laughs> Everybody knows a lot about a lot, don't they? Gracious. I want to speak to you briefly this morning, and then we have an awesome musical presentation about our Savior, the Lord. Everything we do here is all about the Lord. We are Bible believers. It isn't about church. It isn't about... We, we do a lot of great work, and all over the world, we're on 91 fields of the world, and last year our church gave over $400,000 for missions to build churches and orphanages. So we do a lot of that, but that's, that's not what we're like. <laughs> Through you, you've done all that, but you're led to do it because of the Lord. If the Lord isn't the Lord of the church and the head of the church, and the Bible isn't the final book and the final answer and the final manual, uh, manual of how the church is organized and run, then a church doesn't function. Just becomes a social club for saints, maybe, instead of a hospital for sinners. Amen? Is that right or not? Now, they've given me a little time today before the musical, and so it, it is with great, you know, determination and preparation that a shorter sermon takes Dif more difficulty of homework. In fact, my son and daughter-in-law from Orlando, my two grandbabies are here. And uh, when I started to leave this morning, uh, I let them pick out this tie, and they did good. And then uh, my daughter-in-law said, uh, when she looked at my Bible, with notes, she said, is that your homework? I said, yeah, I've been doing homework since I was six years old in kindergarten, <laughs> first grade. And I do, I do not want to lay an egg. A terrible golfer was out playing, hit off the end of the club. It just circled right around. There was a farm nearby, went right into, right into the yard and killed a hen. So he felt bad about it. He knocked on the door. He said, I'm afraid that I killed one of your hens. He said, yeah, my, my, my hens are valuable. They lay a lot of eggs. He said, well, I feel bad about it. What can I do? He said, well, how many eggs can you lay a day? <laughs> so I don't want to do that. I want to talk about the Lord today. I don't want to talk about culture, politics, and all that stuff. I want to talk about the Lord. Are you prioritizing and focusing on the Lord? That's what we do every week around here with all our many ministries. The Lord must be the head of all because He's the only one worthy of our worship. He's the only one who ever did anything for us, really. He died for you and me. He didn't die for Himself. He was, according to the hypostatic union, he was God as if he were not man, and man as if he were not God. So I want to share six brief things for you to think about. Find out where you are spiritually. Find out, if you can, what your purpose in life is, because the two most important days of our life is when we're born and when we discover why we were born. Those are the two greatest things. The chief priests and the Pharisees, who were the religious crowd, were determined that Jesus was going to stay in the grave. They used every resource and power available to see to that. Many secured the tomb by placing a seal. They secured the tomb by placing a seal on the great stone that had been rolled in front of it to close the entrance. They also posted guards at the entrance of the tomb. Centurion, which means a hundred. As a matter of fact, they posted guards at the entrance of the tomb, and there were these were not the uh, uh, what we call in the Greek spectacula, which who were bodyguards or executioners, and not the phulax, who were keepers, but the elite custodia, who in the Roman Empire's Roman army special forces, like Green Beret, SEALs, and so forth. 
in spite of all their human efforts, the Jewish leaders were unable to prevent Jesus from accomplishing what he had already been determined and promised. And it may look like he's not accomplishing what he's wanting to do today, but you're just not looking in the right direction. According to the prophecy of the Word of God, the 318 prophecies of the New Testament about His power and coming, according to the 1800 prophecies in the Bible, all absolutely true, happening in the right sequence, God is right on time. He isn't late. He isn't early. In spite of all their human efforts, they were unable to do that. After three days, He said, I will rise again. Matthew 27, 83, or 63 says, These carnal-minded religious leaders did not know that nothing in the physical realm has the ability to hinder the divine from will from accomplishing the purpose. You cannot stop a real resurrection. Now, there are six things. How important is the resurrection? I'll give you some slides, so if you want to take some notes, please do so. In 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19, here's an amazing, powerful passage of Scripture. And so in these Scriptures, as we look at uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12, Now if Christ be preached that He rose from the dead. Now this is very, very distinguishing because there, ha there have been and there are many powerful religious leaders where millions follow them for their moral teachings their spiritual platitudes, and so forth. But none have proven that they are directly connected to God because they did not come from their tomb in three days. I don't know about you, but as I progress in life and now approaching 80, having 65 years of believing, preaching the Bible, starting churches when I was in my early 20s, living, researching, looking at everything, I don't know about you, but I'm not interested in a dead religious leader. I am interested in a living Savior who conquered death, hell, and the grave. Amen. It's okay to say amen in this church. You know what that means? It means that's right. In fact, some people even say amen, that's right. Amen. amen. Now, let me share with you these six. According to 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19, they're found here, if you have your Bibles. If you don't, we put the Scripture up for you. Now, if Christ be preached that He rose from the dead, how say some among you there is no resurrection of the dead? Well, it would be easy to say that. We uh, go to memorialize cremations. We go to, to the cemetery to see the plot. The hole is dug. The casket is lowered. And we logically conclude there's no resurrection of the dead. We haven't seen one. The graves are still untouched. Our friends and loved ones have not come back. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is your preaching vain and your faith is also vain. You and I are foolish to be here just to be religious. Amen. Yea, and we're found false witnesses of God. Because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, no matter who you believe in, even in Him. You are yet in your sins against a holy and righteous God. Then they also which are fallen asleep, our loved ones, our ancestors, our leaders, those whom we've mourned as we've seen presidents who were kept in the rotunda and, and paraded in the streets as being killed like John F. Kennedy and others. The Bible says here, they have no hope. Then they which also fallen asleep in Christ have perished, and if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Why? To believe on Christ, Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. This easy believism, well, I believe in Jesus Sunday morning occasionally or Easter and Christmas, but the rest of the time, you know, forget that. That's not a Christian. That's not a believer in Christ. That's not a disciple. That's a person who makes a mouth profession whose works, James says, don't match. He says, show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. So a Christian has fruit in their life. 
They love other people. They want to have their friends saved, their relatives saved. They're excited about the work of God. They support missions. They try to get the gospel out wherever they can. If that's not evident in the life, nothing has happened. Amen. Now, let me be careful. Everything that I say coming from the Scripture. First of all, the number one thing is our preaching is not profitable. So you might as well take a psychology course, and that'll give you some help maybe for a while. Uh, there are many preachers who have turned from the truth of the gospel, and they do preach mental health and have preached mental health. The greatest mental health you can ever have is the hope of the glorious resurrection and the Holy Spirit in your heart and the gospel to guide your life and the Bible to lead you into truth. That's the greatest mental health you can ever have. No one can match that. I'm living proof of it, and so are many of you. So in verse 14, the Bible says, Our preaching is profitless. If Christ be not risen, our preaching is in vain. Vain means empty, futile, with no purpose, a colossal waste of time. The heart of the gospel is this in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, not hearsay, rumors, although there were more witnesses at His resurrection and that 40 days afterwards and His ascension than almost any event in history. Any preacher who preaches that the body of Christ still lies in a nameless tomb, but the Spirit of Jesus still marches on, is not of God, but is heretical and of Satan. Number two, our faith is foolish. You'll hear people say, well, I, I have faith in what? You can't have faith or trust without an object. Our trust is in God, because in ourselves there's nothing we can do to keep ourselves from getting older, taking on some disease, eventually dying, because that is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. There's nothing you can do about that. doesn't matter how rich you are or how poor you are. You're not going to escape that. But the God of heaven has made a way of escape, and His name is Jesus Christ, who's conquered death, hell, and the grave. Someone asked me this morning, I've been sick a little bit, and uh, they said, are you, are you good now? I said, well, I'm about 75%. Not 100, about 75. They said, well, when do you expect to get to be 100? I said, when the rapture comes or when I die and have a new and glorified body. That's when I expect to be 100%. Number two, our faith is foolish, as I said. He goes on to say in verse 14, and your faith is in vain. That is to say that you're trusting in something that does not deserve your trust. Who wants to put their faith in the Lord Jesus if Jesus is dead? That's why the Bible says in Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe or trust in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Now, there's no other promise in the Bible that is going to save you. Joining a church will not do it. I joined a church three years before I actually received Christ. I was baptized three years before I received Christ. I believed in my head that I was a Christian but I was not. There was no change in me. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So the Bible says we would be saved. You see, this is a paramount difference between Jesus and the rest of the founders of the world's religion. These guys lived, they died, and they are dead. Jesus lived, Jesus died, and Jesus rose from the dead. Whether you worship trees or worship Buddha, Confucius, Mohammed, it doesn't, it, it doesn't show any relationship with God. It's in vain, according to the Bible. A Buddhist in Africa was converted to Christianity. They asked this Buddhist, why, why'd you change your, why, why did you find this faith, change this faith? Here's what he said. It's like this. As I studied and thought, he said, if you're walking along and come to a fork in the road and two men were there and one was dead and the other one was alive, wh whose directions would you follow? <laughs> Number three, the disciples who all died horrible deaths, more horrible than most of us can imagine, pulled apart by horses, boiled in oil. Horrible, horrific, long-suffering, excruciating lives because they would not recant their trust their belief, 
their testimony, they went everywhere saying, we have seen him after he was resurrected and every one of them died a horrible death except John the apostle on the Isle of Patmos. So the disciples are deceivers. Now think about it. All these who wrote the books of the Bible, the Holy Spirit is the inspirer of the Bible. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, but God used Paul for 13 of those. God used James, John, and Peter, and all of them to give us Holy Scripture. They were witnesses of the resurrection. All of them are deceivers. All of them are liars. And they thought Jesus was dead in the tomb, and I don't think they grasped the idea, even though he told them, destroy this temple, he's talking about his body, and I'll raise it up in three days. They knew this intellectually, but they did not really trust it. Are some of you like that? You know it, but you don't really trust it. It takes the faith of Jesus Christ to know it and trust it. They are deceivers. In 1 Corinthians 15, we are found false witnesses of God. That's what Paul himself said. Paul's not saying that if there was no resurrection, then they were, we were just mistaken. He isn't saying that they were deliberate, he, he, he was saying that they were deliberate false witnesses, lied on purpose. False witness is somebody who gets in a courtroom and knowingly, willingly, deliberately perjures himself and becomes a liar. Paul is saying that he and the disciples were testifying to the fact that Jesus is alive. After the resurrection, these disciples talked with him, ate with him, fellowship with him, touched him. You may say, well, pastor, how do we know that the disciples were a bunch of liars? How do we know that they didn't just make up the Easter story just to save face? Save face? They gave up their lives for that story. Peter died crucified upside down because he said, I am not worthy to die like the Savior. Now, what would you die for? Number four, sin then becomes sovereign. We know sin brings death. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, physical death, death as we know it. Sin originally brought death in God's creation so that man was intended to live forever, but not as he is. You see, we are a spirit. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. We have a soul, which gives us personality and so forth, and we live in a body. Does our body need remodeling? I don't know about you, but my body has needed some serious maintenance in the last five years. you got to fix this thing. That's what the Bible's like. But one day, the Lord is going to come, or I'm going to die, which dying sounds horrible, terrible, negative, and... To the human eye, it is. But really, it's just moving day. The Holy Spirit brings the big U-Haul truck, says, time to go. We're not going to take a thing. No. Well, why would you bring a U-Haul truck? Just to remind you, you're not taking a thing with you. God is going to take and create every hair of your head brand new. He's going to give you a new and glorified body, and you're going to move out of this terrible body you got going here. Well, won't that be a glorious day? Yeah. Moving day. So sin becomes sovereign if Christ did not pay for our sin. Sin not only kills our, our, our body, sin will take us to a place where God is not. When God raised him from the dead, there was positive proof that he was made the full payment for our, our sins. That's why Paul says he was delivered up for our offenses. You know, every sin I ever committed, every sin I ever will commit, the Bible said where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. If you're carrying a load of sin, deception, lies, all the things that are in your heart, be not dismayed. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's a glorious thing. Without the resurrection of Christ, there's no hope in, of heaven. Without the resurrection, there's no Savior. With no Savior, there's no forgiveness of sin to a holy God who created us. No forgiveness, no justification. No justification, no cleansing. No cleansing, you have to pay the penalty for your sins and they will never be paid by anything you can do. Therefore, they are ongoing for eternity. Number five, 
death has dominion. Then they also which have fallen asleep in Christ are perished. You're going to ask me to believe that the intelligence that created this universe is going to let it all die down into the grave? That God has not created you just to die? Isn't it awesome to know that our loved ones, mother, father, grandparents, children, friends, relatives that knew the Lord, we will one day see them again? If Christ be not risen, our preaching is profitless, our faith is foolish, our, the disciples are deceivers, sin is sovereign, death has dominion. One last tragic consequence, the future is futile. That's why people who do not believe say, let us eat, drink, and be merry, get everything we can, possess everything we can, have all the pleasure we can, because it's going to be all over. Verse 19 says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. That is a miserable way to look at life. What does that mean? That, that this is all there is? This is really bad news. If you don't believe in the resurrection, then you must believe that good times are for the moment and life is going to get worse. If that's what you believe while you're young, you better make money and have a good time because when you get old, growing old is not for sissies. It's not the golden age, it's the brass age. <laughs> Ernest Hemingway said, it's as though we are a colony of ants living on one end of a burning log. I mean, think about people who don't, who don't know Jesus. What do they have to look forward to? A hole in the ground? But I have good, some good news for you. Jesus Christ is risen and resurrected from the dead. And you and I know the preaching of the Word of God is profitable for us to live and be prepared to die. Our faith is not only good, but it's feasible. The disciples are dependable. Sin is subdued. Death is defeated. And the future is fabulous. You have observed a service that has truly been a great blessing with the music and the worship of the resurrection. I wonder, as the Bible says, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. Jesus' death was totally different than ours in the sense that he died for us. We can't die for ourselves or for anyone. All we can do is be subject to that time when we have an appointment. Our life on earth is ending. But I ask you today, are you prepared? Some may say, well, I'm a member of the church, but that is not what the Bible says. Well, I've been baptized, but that's after you're a believer, not before. It isn't scripturally sound to say that. Others say, well, I've done the best I can. Yes, but you see, our best fails from the very moment we start thinking like that. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I can't boast about serving the Lord for decades. That isn't, doesn't do a thing for my redemption. Why? Because that doesn't erase any sin. That doesn't take care of the need for holiness to get into heaven, righteousness, redemption. And I'm glad, too, not just to be ready and prepared and have a place reserved for me. Jesus said... I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. But you see, Christianity is all about the Word of God, and the Word of God is all about the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, how He died for our sins. He died for your sins, according to the Scriptures. He was buried, put in a tomb, absolutely dead, but He resurrected Himself. And the Bible says three days later, that he came forth from the tomb and then for 40 days ministered to the apostles, disciples, many others saw him. And on the day when he ascended into heaven in Acts, over 500 uh, brethren, over 500 believers gathered to see his ascension. A great document to history. The Lord Jesus is coming again. Or we may not be alive when he comes again. We may be. Anytime that can happen. But we are all going to reach that day. Now, if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, He is the only Messiah. And the Scriptures are very clear that He must give us eternal life. He must redeem us. The Bible says, We who were dead in trespasses and sins has He made alive. 
So it's the new birth. It's justification. It's redemption. It's all those things. He redeems us from the penalty of death, sin, and the grave. The Bible says He is our Savior. And the Lord God has made it so that not just rich people can go to heaven, not just morally good people could go to heaven. That has nothing to do with going to heaven. Going to heaven has to do with removing the curse and penalty of sin, death, hell, and the grave. And Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who died for our sins. And I urge you today to realize Jesus said, unless you come with the faith of a little child, you'll no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. It isn't how educated we are. It isn't how rich or how moral we are. It is do we realize that we are under the sentence of death and only the Lord can remove us from that sentence. So the Bible tells us in Romans 10, 13, whosoever believes or calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says it is a gift. As I reach out to give you a gift, you receive the gift, and that's how it has to be. It has to be a supernatural thing. Those that are in Christ are new creatures. Jesus said to Nicodemus, a very religious man, you must be born again. Now it's great that you're interested in Easter, but if, you're not, if you do not know the Savior and you're not interested in the future and you're not interested in His resurrection, then you need to be today. I urge you, as we have been doing for all these centuries since Jesus came, He is the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. Would you bow your heads and pray and say, Oh Lord, I realize I'm a sinner. I realize that I'm imperfect. I realize I'm not holy like you are. And I would like to go to heaven when I die. Therefore, I confess to you and repent of my sin, and I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe on Him in my heart, and I confess Him in prayer with my mouth. And if you'll do that, I'll see you soon, or one day I'll see you in heaven if we never get together in this city or never see you personally, because all that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He that comes to me, I'll in no wise cast out. You're not too big a sinner. People say that, but you're not. Where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. And as the Lord saved me 65 years ago and millions of others through all these years, He will save you today. He loves you. He wants to forgive you and save you more than you could ever want it. And there is no one that He will turn away if you'll believe on Him. So I ask you to do that. And then if you have, uh, email us. Get in touch with us. Let us rejoice with you. I ask you to do that in Jesus' name. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you will, at this moment, help us to have clear minds. Those who do, do not look at a time when they trusted you and cannot name a season at least when they were born again, help them to have this assurance today in prayer, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.